Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 194, we're going to talk briefly about RCA clear tops. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, today is sort of a quick and fun episode because we got huge shipments of really high quality vintage tubes that are, well, they were in such demand that our inventory sold down during the great summer sale. And we'll go over and we'll go through them. Well, Charles will go through them. <laughs> Charles is the tube hound. Um, and we'll go through them and, um, yeah, and see what came in. So, the Radio Corporation of America, or as most people call it, RCA, was a giant back in the days when radio, 78 records, and later, long play records, that's what people call vinyl today, were... That was how music was consumed. And of course, vacuum tubes were a huge part of that business. But what many don't realize is when GE and Westinghouse formed RCA, they started it with the patents of Marconi USA. That's right, Marconi um, basically was the prime inventor of radio. There were huge number of people that contributed over a long span of time um, but he gets the final credit and his company uh, was one of the first global international electronics companies and the U.S. division became the foundation of what became RCA and of course it was the patents that really mattered and well I guess we're going to be looking at some of those patents. Charles what have you got to show us? Okay well we've and done what the heck is a clear top? <laughs> uh, nice to slip that in there. Okay, so we actually have three later version RCA tubes in here, which is kind of interesting. And as Dad mentioned earlier, RCA shares a lot of similarities, at least their two construction does, with GE and Westinghouse. And that's almost certainly because many of the patents were shared between them, so the technology was developed in the same place. So what we have here are three different um, general purpose dual triodes that are all medium mu or amplification factor. And, and what's a dual triode? Well, it's two, essentially two tubes in a tube, <laughs> two sets of electrodes in one tube. So you could do things like you could have one, uh, one section per channel. You could have one section acting as a cathode follower on the other side. Uh, you could run an amplification or an oscillator. Um, it just allowed for more space savings and more efficiency because then you only need one heater for two sections. So one tube like the one you got your hands on could basically be a stereo amplifier. Yeah, exactly. Now it's probably not going to be ideal, but you could do it. And there are some amps out there that are designed with a single tube in them. And I believe they're called spud amps. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wouldn't be using a 12AU7 for a spud amp. But... No, probably not. But uh, so all these are essentially the same tube for the same purpose with just slightly different uh, bases and specs to them. So of course we've got the beautiful RCA clear top 12AU7. And whenever we say clear top, I think it's fairly obvious from the video here, we don't have a getter on the top. And the getter is just a piece of wire or foil or a cup and they heat it up and it flashes off this sort of silvery coating here. And that is to help maintain the vacuum and capture stray electrons. And RCA, along with GE in their later versions, tended to have side getters and not top getters. So here's, we've got a side getter 6CG7. And here we've got a side getter 6SN7. And some of the reason for this was probably to try and help keep the tubes as short as possible. Let's keep that in focus. Um, We're really not sure if it affects the sonics. I mean, for years now, I've said categorically that the, the gettering, uh, the amount of gettering, the location of the getter, um, 
how many getters there are. Because some <laughs> of the so we're going to actually see um, some uh, big KT88s that came in that have a pair of getters, mm -hmm. um, and something like the GU50 I think has three getters on it. Amazingly, yeah. Um, we're really not sure if it affects the sound. I, I've I have said for a long time I don't think it does. But, you know, everything matters in audio. So it's possible that some configurations of physical construction uh, affect the sonics. And I think mm -hmm. that's quite possible. Now, whether it affects it, you know, neutrally or a lateral change in the sound or whether it improves something, I'm not really sure. But one thing we do know is that the RCA 12A U7 clear tops probably have one of the best treble presentations that any tube ever made. I'm not talking just about a 12AU7. I'm talking about every tube ever made. Yeah. It's just an amazing crystal clear um, into the stratosphere. I mean, the frequency response is unbelievable. Now, most tubes can go up into the very, very high frequencies, way beyond what audio requires. It's easily. actually one of the things that tubes are best at. Yeah. 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 But uh, getting a nice sounding treble can be challenging, in, in a, especially a lot of modern amplifiers and especially with modern tubes. It's a, something that they really challenge with. Yeah, really it, challenge with. It's, kind of, it's kind of interesting, eh? Because, I mean, vintage tubes, um, even an average vintage tube, and we don't sell very many average vintage tubes, but even an average vintage tube has a warm, rich, sonic presentation with uh, a good frequency response from the low frequencies all the way up into the treble with no harshness. Yeah. And yet a lot of modern tubes have this edge to them. Mm -hmm. which... And we get comments about that all the time. We get questions, how do I get the harshness out of my new amplifier with my new tubes? And well, the answer is put in some old tubes. Yeah. Well, don't put some old tubes in, put well, some new old tubes. New old in. tubes if you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they're available. So, this is just, uh, it's an interesting look at it. I think part of what the, the side getters did was maybe they lowered the, the total weight of the tube. They made them so that they could have a shorter bottle. Maybe they were a little less microphonic. But whatever it was that RCA was doing, it was working with these tubes. So whenever you hear RCA clear top version of anything, and there's a 12AX7 version, there's a 12BH7 version, um, they tend to be good sounding, reliable tubes, and uh, these are no exception. Even the 6CG7s, even though they test, they tend to test a little mismatched, um, they test very high for 6CG7s, so they tend to have a higher amplification factor. So our, I mean, we don't sell mismatched tubes, so no, no, of our, our loss rate is quite high, but we, Charles is actually the fellow who puts together matched pairs. Yep. And, uh, and you just put together a huge number of uh, really good quality vintage tubes. And I updated the store, so why don't we jump yeah. in and, and see what you've Well, the first one for is this middle guy here. So this is the 6CG7, and we actually managed to find a reasonable number of them used. And that's not very common, and it's not common for them to be testing good whenever they're used, but these ones were. And I believe we got four nice close matched pairs of them in the store right now. So this, of course, is a 9-pin version of a 6SN7, so you can run it in a 6SN7 slot with the correct 9-pin adapter that we also sell in the store. What's this H that you've marked on the label? So that's our own notation here to mark that it's a high tester, and we have a specific setting on our testers to turn that to for these. Otherwise, they peg the meters. That's how how high they typically test. So it's essentially an over-spec tube. Yep, and all these RCA clear tops tend to be over-spec. It's, it's really quite interesting. No, it doesn't make it a super-duper tube, does it? It just means that they were... You'll get a bit more gain out of it. You get a bit more gain out of it. It also means that the factory probably was actually manufacturing them over-spec. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, and, and as they get older too, that you will get more life out of them because they started a bit ahead, basically. That's not normal though. I mean, we test thousands of tubes in a year and most tubes are actually really close to the center Newell stock expected uh, GM number. But occasionally you get ones that average over or average under. Uh, a yeah, good I mean, example are the, the Sylvania 6SL7 WGTs. They tend to test, you know, 10 to 20% over, yeah. if not more. And Tungsol 6SN7s tend to test 10 to 20% below normal. Yep. That's just and they still like. sound great. So, yeah. That's yeah, just the way they are. That's okay. always nice when they test over, not under. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else have you got for us, Charles? Okay, well, let's clear the deck and we'll be back in just a second. Okay, well, this is 
um, half, maybe not even half of the types that we've gotten in in the last week or so. They've been busy testing them. Um, I'm just going to go through them real quick because we don't want this to be too long of an episode. So over here we've got something that we have recently been trying to get more in of and these are Toshiba. 6SN7 GTBs, incredibly rare, hard to find tubes. Um, we're occasionally getting in uh, singles, pairs, and we're trying to match them up. And we have a couple of used pairs in thanks to uh, some recent purchases. And these are just really nice sounding tubes. Uh, we've been uh, surprised over and over again at just how good Toshiba tubes sound. And uh, we're just going to keep trying to find more of them for you guys. And then next up we have one of our favorite Sylvania tubes in a used and a new old stock version and these are the GTA chrome domes. These are the angle plate version, so this is the second version of the GTA that was made. You can see the well, labels, yeah, partially worn there. And the first version had a back-to-back -back straight plate. Mm -hmm. But it still had the big chrome dome on there. Yeah. And these have that beautiful Sylvania warm house sound in spades. They're one of our favorite tubes. They're just great sounding. And we've been able to find in both used and new old stock enough to make a few more pairs in the store. And the interesting thing about the Sylvania uh, sound, the presentation, is that not only do they have a warm, rich sound, but they balance that really quite well with the level of detail that the tube presents. And that's unusual to have that sort of a balance. Normally if a tube goes hard onto the warm sound... Uh, you lose detail. You generally. lose detail because basically the detail is buried underneath um, all of um, those harmonics that we love so much in vacuum tubes. Yep. Um, so how they did that I don't know but they did it really well and they did it with the 6SL7, the 6SN7, um, and uh, with a number of other tubes and it was clearly by design and what that gives you is sort of the the best of both worlds a, a well detailed tube that still has that warm rich um, sonic profile that most people who are into tubes really cherish it's, it's got a really nice balance to it and so does our next tube in the list here another recent one that people have been going crazy over another 6CG7 and this is, uh, again, a 6SN7 equivalent in, an, in a 9-pin bottle made by Toshiba. When you say equivalent, do you mean like a close equivalent? No, direct equivalent. I mean, except for the base, of course. Uh, but you can pop this into a 9-pin to octal adapter, and you can plug it into the same slot that any of these would go into, and it's going to run just fine. So when it was designed, it was designed with the exact same electrical properties as it, a 6SN7. Yep, it was designed to be a direct replacement, just in a smaller bottle. And right. these are, are amazing-sounding tubes. They're, they aren't like the, the Sylvanias. Uh, but they tend to be known a bit more for the separation between the instruments and the wonderful sound stage that they bring out. So I think these would actually, I would consider them to be much closer to the, to the famous Tungsol 6SN7s. Yeah, but still different and unique different. in their own way. Yeah, you know? different and unique. But when it comes to detail, those, uh, those early Tungsols, they rule. But they don't have the same rich sonics as the Sylvania, so... Mm. Yeah, which is why we roll tubes <laughs> yeah. and why we don't carry just one tube. <laughs> exactly. And to end things off with my little pile here, we have another Japanese made tube that we uh, we've really been getting behind recently. And this is the Matsushita 12 AX7. And we've been able to find in a decent number of new old stock of these guys. And that's hard to find. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to find a 12AX7 that actually sounds good. And this is the best one that I've heard yet. And it's like a Mullard because it was made on Mullard tooling. You can see the side holes there. Uh, Mullard helped get them set up. and But they, they don't tend to have the noise or the microphonics issues that Mullards yeah. do. So it's actually a better Mullard. Yeah, basically. And, um, you know, that's saying something. Mullard made some fantastic tubes. And, and the 12AX7 version, I used to specialize them year, for years and years ago. And... Um, and they would sell instantly. It was one of my first high-value tubes. And um, and the failure rate of those tubes uh, before I got them into the store was incredible. Yeah, um, we lose at least half of them, probably more. And now they're basically unob unobtainium. So the yep. Massachusetts is a really, it's a, in my opinion, it's a, it's a better option. And yep. even though we don't find a lot of them, um, 
uh, we do keep them in stock on a fairly regular basis. They sell really quickly though. Yep, and I think we have at least two, maybe three pairs of them in there now, so uh, they're gonna go quick. And speaking of going quick, we're gonna clear the deck and bring out something that's probably not gonna last for a few hours after this video gets posted. We'll be right back. Okay, well, this is probably, oh, they're, they're such big tubes, maybe we should back out a little bit for you. <laughs> these, um, these are probably the best sounding KT88s ever made. And this is the true vintage Svetlana tube made in St. Petersburg. Production stopped sometime in the early 2000s. Um, but the date's not 100% certain because there was a lot of inventory, I think, in, in, in the warehouse, both in, um, in Russia and uh, in the American distributors warehouse. So it took a long time for them to sell down. But they've been gone, new old stock's been gone for um, at least a decade. And um, these these do everything really well. They have um, they have that the, the punch of the KT88 type. So bass is always really good with most KT88s. The problem with a lot of the modern KT88s is that they, they're firecrackers. They don't last long. And of course, they're a higher powered tube, so it's not an easy tube to build properly. In fact, uh, when Svetlana started building the 6550, they had a complete failure in one of their runs. And those tubes, the 6550B, B shows up uh, occasionally on the marketplace and for peanuts, but of course they're garbage tubes. Uh, uh, if you ever see a uh, Svetlana 6550B with a clear top on it, speaking of clear tops, don't buy it. It's a B version <laughs> and it's probably not going to work for very long if it works at all. Yeah. Now the C version they fixed. Um, and, and they're fantastic tubes. And they're fantastic tubes. And this is essentially, the KT88 is essentially a high powered version of the 6550. So, um, but what these do that most KT88s don't do well is they have a nice little bit of warmth in the mid range. Most KT88s have a, it's kind of a, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's sort of a neutral and yet harsh mid range. Now, that's in comparison to a nice mid-range sound. <laughs> so, they really aren't that bad. But when you, when you hear something like the, the real Svetlana's, you think, wow, okay, where have these been all of my life? <laughs> Anyways, they're rare now, they're hard to find, they're hard to match up. So we've got, we have a set that's actually, I think it's testing, uh, Right on new old stock or close to it? What's the new old stock value? I, I think actually they're testing a little bit over our, our new old stock value on the tester. But they're all used tubes, but they're in very good condition. And the way we know how many hours a tube has on it is we take a look at the gettering. So big high power tubes in particular, really, they work really hard. They expand with the heat, they contract as they cool off. Um, and the heat level inside of this envelope is incredible. And that puts a lot of pressure, I think, on maintaining a good vacuum. So you can see up here, you see the two cup gutters at the top that's very typical of Soviet era tubes. And what they wanted to do is put a lot of gettering material in here. That helps maintain the vacuum over a long period of time. But as the tube uh, hours increase, of course, the gettering decreases. So when you have a nice full silver cap down to the sides and you don't see too much of an edge deterioration, you see here, there's a little bit of an edge deterioration. It's not hardly anything. And you would see that even on a brand new tube. When that starts going white or fading away and when you see it fade away, you'll know right away when you look at it. It basically gets very, very thin. That's an indication that the tube's got hours on it. And unfortunately, big power tubes like the KT88, they once they start to go like that, they're, they're getting near the end of their life. They still will probably operate for a while until they pop, but um, it's, a good, it's a good indication always with power tubes to look at your gettering. Anyways, we've got one matched used quad in the store. And we're lucky if we get one or two a year at this point. Yeah, well, we might make three. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. but it's getting harder and harder. Yeah, so it's always a, a day to celebrate when we find some. And if you stayed all the way to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. There's a secret code that I almost gave completely away, I think, a few weeks ago. I think you might have. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, we can reach almost everybody around the world with $20 flat sh shipping. Though, the, if you live in a difficult-to-ship region, please use a mail forwarder or contact us before ordering because some regions, the Philippines in particular, is a, a real problem spot, but... In the um, Far East, there's regions that are difficult, or if you're in a, on an island nation, they're also difficult to reach. And we can't do flat rate shipping to those places. Yeah. It's just not reasonable, and, and have it arrive safely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the big problems with odd places to ship is that we they're not normally part of the International Postal Union Agreement, which means there's no tracking available, and we're not... We really don't want to ship high value articles without tracking. But if your order, for the rest of you, if your order's over $150 after discount, the shipping is free. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.